Hey everybody, it's Carissa, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Amina Ahmed today. Um, she has like a gazillion awards, went to the Writers Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, she's a Stegner Fellow. Um, she just came out with the return of Faraz Ali, which um, I've loved so much that I've destroyed the cover. Um, and spilled on it. But anyway, uh, I'm really excited to talk to you today about kind of your, I hate to not for lack of a better word, journey is how you got here, um, your creative practice. And also, there's so much like embedded psychology and understanding structures of society and our roles and our limitations in the book that I just kind of wanted to talk through. Um, I think that for me, the really well, actually, can you give a brief sort of summary of the novel? Sure, great. Um, I would love to. Thank you, first of all, for having me, Carissa. I'm so happy to get to talk to you about the book. The book, um, The Return of Faraz Ali, tells the story of a man who um, is asked to cover up a crime. So it, it reads initially very much like a crime story. Um, and he's asked to go to the old city in Lahore. It's set in the 1960s in Pakistan. And he's asked to go and, and do this cover up in the um, red light district of the city. But the person who's asking him to do this is his father. And, um, and we learn that he, as a young boy, was taken by his father from this area. This is the area that he is, he is from and that he grew up, spent his early childhood in. But his father took him from there in order to give him a better life. And now is kind of calling in on that debt by saying, I'm in trouble and I need your help. So when Faraz Ali goes to the old city to investigate the crime and he discovers what it is, um, he kind of has to make decisions about whether he is going to fulfill like this obligation to his father. And, um, and also I think he, he's, he's faced with the fact that it's kind of a return to his past. Um, and is he going to go find this family? What is his father's connection to this crime? Does his family still live here? Is he still going to find them? What will it mean if he does? And what will it mean if he doesn't? And that's kind of how the story begins and really kind of grows from there. I think um, for for me, where did it, so can you talk a little bit about how what got you excited about the story or how how you kind of um, what your process is like? Because this is a this is sort of like a, a major endeavor and and what your connection like? Did you spend time in Pakistan? Because um, you grew up in the UK, right? You're right. You're right. I did grow up in the UK. I went to Pakistan very frequently as a kid, so I had kind of. Um, a kind of a strong relationship with Pakistan and um, I had family there who I who I visited uh, each year and sometimes twice a year even we were really lucky we got to travel there a lot and um, yeah I felt really connected with Pakistan it was where I learned Urdu um, um, but also it was just so entirely different to the kind of the world of the UK in every oh. way yeah I mean I think um everything from the landscape to the way social interactions happened. Um, I, I mean, there were, there were other things that I felt in some ways more comfortable because I, I looked like everybody else. Um, but in other ways, I was really struck by the, the, the things that were very different and things that were harder in Pakistan. There was a lack of public space. It was harder as a girl to go around freely. Um, so these were things that kind of, you know, were early impressions I had. Um, but also like the warmth and connection with family that, you know, we didn't have this kind of extended family in England. But I came to Pakistan and I found that. And my father's family home, that the place that they rented, was pretty close to the old city of Lahore, mm -hmm. not in it. Um, and I didn't go there much at all growing up to the old city, which is basically this very ancient part of Lahore. It's walled in. Um, the, much of the wall and the gates are no longer there. But psychologically, there is a kind of gap between that part of the city and the rest of Lahore. So we didn't go there, but the way people would talk about the old city um, as though it was this different place, I mean, I found it really intriguing. It felt like this really kind of mysterious, shadowy, interesting place. And when later on in life, I went and visited there and, you know, the geography, it really is like a maze. Um, tiny crowded streets and alleyways and 
the roofs are so close, the buildings kind of loom, people do jump from roof to roof, um, which they do in the book, you know, that's kind of one of the ways they move around that part of the city. It was really fascinating to me. And um, I felt like, and I, I'd been always a big fan of kind of noir. And I, I thought I was like Lahore, this part of Lahore is a great setting for that kind of a story. Just like kind of Chandler's LA has these mean streets. I was like, oh, Lahore does too. Um, and so actually a lot of it was about, you know, exploring Pakistan as a place, exploring this part of the city as a place. And I think if you are sort of a somebody who grows up in a diaspora, you're often trying to work out what your relationship is to your, your kind of country of origin and what your relationship is to that heritage. And in a way, writing the book was, was me trying to figure that out a little bit as well. Do you think, um, so can you talk a little bit about Ferez and sort of where his, his, his personality or who, who he is and why he exists or needed to exist as he does now? Yeah, I think for us, for us is an interesting character because I think for me, my relationship changed over the course of the book, um, writing him. Um, I think, um, you know, he is, he's in the police um, and the police have a great deal of power um, in, in, I mean, everywhere really, but particularly in Pakistani society. Um, and they're very much a tool of the state and, and really seen as kind of a force of state oppression. Um, and, you know, the first moment we see Faraz in the book, he's beating a protester up. Um, and, you know, I think there is a kind of ingrained violence there. Um, and a oh, like a detachment. It's very... Yeah. Um, detached when he sorry continue I didn't mean to interrupt you but I think that's that's a great word to describe it he is really detached it's kind of just a function of that job I do it I do what I'm told and which is why in a way when he's confronted by a crime that's kind of really just pushes him into that place of like actually can I do this now on top of all the other things I've had to do um but one of the things that kind of interested me about him was that, you know, um, although he definitely represents that very old school um, shape of kind of oppressive force, um, part of, you know, in a society like Pakistan, which is extremely hierarchical, um, being part of state power, you know, being embedded within it is, is kind of a way to protect yourself from it. Um, it's an act of self-preservation if you become part of the system, especially for a man like him who has his origins in the red light city and which is considered disreputable. Um, and he's kind of weighed down by that kind of social position that he's in. So I think I kind of grew to feel more for him over the course of writing the book, the, the weight of carrying those things um, alongside, you know, feeling like, a person like that should be held to account for the things that they they do and he has yeah. done things that I think are you know I mean troubling. I think that there's this moment when he's uh leaving for his new position where there's a a protester a young boy casually says help I'm dying and um it there's sort of there's like like a callousness to it but also again in some ways um the the book really illustrates how we're all in these prisons they're just different I guess yeah. you could say um that's a great way of putting it the everybody's I, trapped what everybody's trapped you know yeah, um but more so I mean some people more so than others I think can you talk a little bit about his sister and kind of her um her I guess for lack of a better word she's also trapped but in a very different a very different situation um, and kind of how she came about. I think I think for me, what's most interesting about her is her relationship with her daughter and her mother and how the ways that she, there's this connective energy called love that, that, that really binds us, but the way that um, she shows love and shows up for love are really, they're different than my conceptions of, of, of love through a Western lens. And I was wondering if you could kind of speak about the role of love in the, in the book and through Romina. 
Right, right. That's a really interesting question. Yeah, she's uh, for us, sister Rosina is one of my favorite characters. I think in in the book, um, she. I mean, just in terms of who she is, she's a courtesan, but she's grown up. This in the world of the book, there is um, a kind of hereditary kind of um, uh, aspect to um, sex work. So she has known she's always going to do this work and she grows up to do it. Um, and she's had an interesting trajectory as a very successful courtesan and very beautiful. Um, she has been recruited into the film industry and she becomes an actress for a while. So she kind of leaves the world of that red light district behind a little bit, but finds that she can't ever truly leave it. And as you say, she has a mother and a daughter who are still there. And she's she's she wants very much for her daughter to have choices and or to have, you know, options that she didn't particularly have. I mean, I think you're right that love looks different in this world. Um, love is kind of about it's it's similar in that, you know, this this notion of love is about providing love is about guaranteeing security, not for yourself, but for the collective good for the family. And that that is kind of her primary um, concern has been whatever I'm doing, I am providing for my mother in, in her old age, which is my job and providing for my child. But she doesn't necessarily want her own child to go into this work. Um, and she wants her to have that choice. But because of the, because of the secrecy around her, the relationship with her child, often it's expressed in an almost sibling-like sisterly frustration and irritation. Um, and I think I, sometimes with Rosina, I feel like she's never had the chance to really love her child because of, of giving her up so early. Um, and as a result, there is a kind of, there's a, you know, a frustration and a rage and she herself, you know, she tries really hard to kind of dictate, you know, her fate in a world which really gives her very few options because of her class, because of her caste background, and because of the work that she's done. Um, also so when you age. say that, and her age, she's she's becoming older, and she can't rely on the things she's she's continually relied on her looks and on the um, on and and her work is built around that. Um, so she kind of has, I think, the you know, a you know, a numerous kind of burdens that she carries, um, and so her love doesn't always look like a tender thing. But I believe that it's really forceful and passionate and deep. Um, uh, I've never thought about love in terms of provision. Yeah, uh, at, at its core, um, and I think that that's a really interesting sort of concept to think about, or for me to kind of really take in. Um, there's, there's a point, I think, where you talk about um, grief and, and holding grief and the sort of like very, at the very beginning, the sort of extreme grief, um, this earth shattering grief, and then that, that being seen as a power, but actually it's, can you talk a little bit about how grief plays into how you yourself view grief? Because um, you say it's, it, it makes, I forget the line, but there's something about ordinary. Um, this holding this extreme grief is is completely ordinary, but it feels so monumental. And holding both of those at the same time, I think, was really poetic. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think grief um, in various ways plays out in the book. A sense of kind of ongoing loss, um, and I suppose I just have a sense that. Um, everybody in the book and, and everybody, 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 we kind of has, has pain. And, you know, most people are kind of trying to manage that pain as sort of best that they can. Um, and those aren't necessarily things that people are able to talk about. Um, but it is a state in which many people and, and, and all of us understand pain, whether it's the pain of relationships and it, that haven't worked in the book pain of not being like Faraz entirely you know happy with who you are and shame around your origins the kind of the grief around that shame um 
the grief around for Rosina not having been the kind of mother that she would like to have been or would like to be. Um, and I'm kind of just amazed by humans, I think, by the way that they, they do suffer a great deal. Um, and, you know, in, in many ways, they, you know, these ways of suffering are not extraordinary or dramatic, um, but that they kind of continue on, you know, um, I find that resilience in people kind of amazing It kind of uh, Beckett says, you know, I can't go on, I will go on. And I, I feel like that spirit is there in, in the way that I kind of view the grief of the characters in the book. There's sort of a, um, I don't know if you say that, I'm, I'm a, a commitment to survival. Right. Uh, to, to continuing, um, yeah. just because it's what we have to do. Um, and I think that that, there's, there's some really, really beautiful and tragic truth to that um, because we don't ultimately it sort of takes away our choice, our, our, our sort of choice. I was wondering um, if you could kind of talk about, there's there's a point in the book and, and you'll have to refresh my memory for um, not um, having the right language around it, but you talk about re sort of understanding strength and weakness as necessity and obligation. And I was wondering if you could kind of speak to the reframe of those two notions. Right. Um, that's a really interesting question as well, strength and weakness. I mean, I think, um, you know, I feel in many ways, like especially in, in, in this book and in this society, characters are really, you know, because it is, you know, socially so stratified and you have that kind of hierarchy and there is this sense of the powerlessness of the people at particularly at the lower end of society and how difficult their every day is and how they have to negotiate constantly all the time um, in order to survive um, but there is a kind of I guess a kind of strength that comes again I think from that resilience and that ability to kind of keep going and keep finding um, ways to go on. Um, there is a scene at, um, in the book where Rosina um, ends up in a in a in a not so great situation, you know, not her ideal situation. Um, her situation kind of deteriorates over the course of the book in terms of what she's what she wants to do and what she gets to do, and. Um, she uh, ends up on the beach and she meets a couple of Americans who are traveling around on the hippie trail. <laughs> so they used to go to India and Pakistan and Iran and Afghanistan. And she meets them and they kind of remark to her that she kind of looks like Liz Taylor. She reminds them of Liz Taylor. And she talks to them about, how, you know, she, she recognizes um, uh, that with Liz Taylor, she makes the association of diamonds and of Richard Burton and Richard Burton buying diamonds for Liz Taylor. But she tells them that, you know, I, I buy my diamonds. That's how I'm different. And there is this sense, you know, Rosina in some ways is, is really crushed in that moment by what's going on in her life and by the weight of all, you know, of her position in that kind of social scale. But, um, you know, the performance of strength um, or the performance of being able to say, you know, I am the master of my destiny still. I'm still the star of my own life. Like for me, that that was kind of about that that sense of strength, even within that position of of being really squashed by the world. I think it strength is sort of a, a useful tool and or 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 delusions of strength is a, a yeah. useful tool in in continuing on um, with life. Um, thank you so much. We're totally out of time. Um, thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much for this book, which I I, I think I told you I'm not I'm not quite finished with, but uh, I was so I'm I'm enraptured. Uh, and I can't wait to finish it. I seriously can't wait for like Margaret to go to bed tonight so I can try to finish it um, and, and, and take care. And do you have anything you wanna leave us with in terms of what you're excited for next? 
You know, um, I mean, I'm excited about a bunch of books that are coming out and, um, you know, uh, I, I'm looking forward. I'm moving this summer, as you know, so I'm excited to see how that turns out and do a lot of reading um, and just kind of start to thinking, to start, you know, being able to start thinking about new projects and new stories, but doing a lot of reading. Okay. Well, I hope this is a great summer for you and good luck with your move. Take care. Again, Thank the return me. of Paris <laughs> is out now. Um, I'll put a link in the newsletter. Uh, thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.